good morning and welcome again to Eternity Church. I'm so glad that you could join us. And I've got a message for you today, which is probably slightly different to our regular kind of church message. I want to ask this question. Is conversation a lost art? Now, Jesus was a master communicator. Um, he, would have helped, he would have helped people absolutely wrapped by his stories and his teachings, his parables. And through it all, he never once spoke a false word and he never allowed any word from his mouth to not count for something. That, that's quite a challenge for us and it's quite an example for us to follow. You know, does everything we say um, actually have substance to it? You know, obviously we, we joke around and have a laugh and that kind of thing. But at the same time, we can do that without being unkind, without being mean, without anybody getting damaged in the process. And um, it's a tough act to follow, obviously, with, with Jesus being God and all. <laughs> but I do believe that the Word of God gives some very clear teaching on communication and how we should and could be talking to one another. The conversation is an art that can be so quickly eroded and even lost when not practiced. And even more so with the advent of social media, which has been a game changer when it comes to communication. And you can communicate with somebody without actually being in the room with them, without actually um, sensing their, their body language and so forth. Um, you can actually have conversations with people without ever actually seeing their shoes <laughs> because you only see people sort of from the um, the chest up, you know, from now on. Um, it, the lockdown robbed many people of varied conversations and um, and teachers at schools talk about how children returned to school under socialized and out of practice of having proper orderly conversations. Some during lockdown were robbed of the opportunity to have conversations at all, and, you know, if a single person was in lockdown, while others were confined to conversations with whoever they lived with, which was great for some, but not for others if the person you were locked down with was a very poor conversationalist. The Bible tells us that good communication is so necessary that we should pay attention not just to what we say, but also to how we say it. So Colossians chapter 4, I'm reading verse 6, um, it says this in, well, it, 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 the message version gives a slightly um, different version, and I'll read both of them to you. But Colossians 4 verse 6 says, Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. That's a really good advice right there. Conversation is full of grace, uh, seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. Um, why he says that is because if you are constantly telling lies and you're constantly getting yourself into a network of deception, you're going to start forgetting which story you've told to which person and which lie you've told to which person. And you're going to get yourself into a knot. <laughs> and, and eventually you're not going to know how to answer people because you can't remember exactly which deception and which story you told that person. And so very, very wise advice there. And the message version says, be gracious in your speech. The goal is to bring out the best in others in conversation and not to put them down and not to cut them out. That's something that's so easily done, especially when it comes to social media, where you can just immediately block somebody, just exit the call without saying goodbye. And um, all of a sudden we find ourselves in a very different world conversationally. Social media has played a very big part in changing our communication. I want to comment on that a little bit, you know, because as Christians, we're not exempt from holiness. We're not exempt from um, the, our Christian practices just because we're now on social media. Social media has played a big part in this, and it's a great tool when it's used properly, like with any real power tool. But likewise, it's also very dangerous in the wrong hands. It it robs people of a genuine face-to-face -face conversation where you see facial expression and hear tone of voice, and it all teaches us um, to not pay attention to others at all. With social media, we can be semi-present. Semi-presence is a new phenomenon where you can have somebody watching a movie with their family, but they're actually talking to eight different people on a group chat at the same time on the mobile phone that they're holding, and no one is getting the benefit of your full attention because multitasking is a myth, by the way. <laughs> Nobody can actually multitask. It's been proven by psychiatrists. You can actually only focus fully on one particular thing that you're doing at one moment. Social media erodes our ability to take a turn in a conversation and to truly hear what another person is saying. 
and we can switch someone off and block them very quickly when they say something we don't agree with. And so what happens then is we lose the skill of debate and verbal confrontation to sort out an issue. We lose the ability to listen to another person's point of view, to formulate an opinion, even a, even a counter opinion to that, and come back with an answer and say, well, I actually see it slightly differently. And that is such a healthy thing to do and to have in conversation is alternate viewpoints so that we can listen and even possibly have our minds changed. And social media can rob us of that. If we only engage in social media to blurt out our opinion, then when somebody says something contrary to our opinion, we say, no, they're a hater and I'm out of here and I'm not, I'm not taking this abuse anymore. When actually they were just entering a conversation and responding to what you had said. We lose the ability on social media to discuss varying viewpoints and to find ourselves um, scared to venture an opposing viewpoint for fear of being branded a hater. And as I've, I've spoken about that before, we also lose body language. So much of our communication is done non-verbally and that skill gets lost when we're not in front of another person. And so misunderstandings can crop up really, really quickly. Never say something to a person on social media that you wouldn't say face to face. Proverbs 18 verse 21 says the tongue has the power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruit. Again, the message version says words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. That thing that you put on social media today, um, which one of those was it? That comment that you made to somebody face to face at the office the other day, which one of those was it? Was it poison or fruit? That thing where you had to get the last word in and then walk away. Was it poison or fruit? What was the residue that you left behind? Did you leave behind a, a, a distaste or did you leave behind a feeling that people are quite sorry that you left because they were enjoying the conversation. With all this in mind, we see the rise of what is called the keyboard warrior, the person who's very big and very brave behind the keyboard, trashing people's reputations, hurling insults via social media, trolling as they call it. Um, but they're not so brave when they step out from behind the computer keyboard. Remember that just because it's social media, and social media is not specifically mentioned in the Bible, it doesn't mean that we will not still be judged for our conduct. And God sees all that we do. And he, he wants us to hold ourselves at all times to a higher standard. Holiness is still holiness when it comes to our online conduct. We're not excused from Christianity when you're on a, um, um, a conversation on a, on a WhatsApp group or a conversation on TikTok or doing something on Facebook, you haven't stepped outside of your Christianity. You haven't stepped outside of your beliefs. You are still you and you still need to be representing everything that you are embodying even when on social media. And in fact, especially when you're on social media, because that has become such a key point of conversation and such a key point of contact with other people. Holiness is still holiness. When dealing on social media, remember, you are still dealing with a human being who might be doing all they can today just to hold it all together. And they ventured an opinion and you come along and trash it with your bulldozer and you've, you've left wreckage in your wake. Sometimes people are longing for a chat online to break their own shell of loneliness and uh, they need to be treated with dignity and kindness. Proverbs 29 verse 11 says, Fools give vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. Be a calming influence in your online dealings. When we talk to each other in real life too, remember to be kind. Kindness can deflect a lot of arrows and it sows good seeds. When it comes to how we speak, the principle of sowing and reaping still applies. What you're putting out there, you're going to get back. I believe in the echo effect of life and sometimes the rudeness we experience is just an echo coming back to us of some rudeness that we showed earlier. Gossip. Let's talk about that for a moment. That's like a disease that spreads. You know, it's like yeast in the dough. You can't put a little bit of yeast in dough when you're making bread and tell the yeast, no, you must just stay in that one little corner of the dough over there because I, I want the rest, you know, I want to have a, f a strange effect on the bread here. But the yeast just spreads. It, it spreads through, you, 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 can't, you can't stop it. That's what gossip does. It's like a yeast that spreads. It's a disease that spreads. Listen to how your friends 
talk about other people who are not there because that is exactly how they will talk about you when you leave the room. Don't you dare for one moment be foolish enough to assume that you are immune to being spoken about. If you're hanging around with a bunch of gossips who are talking about people that are not present, they are going to talk about you. I have come into a room sometimes knowing full well by the facial expressions that I have just been on the menu. And what has been said was been, has been derogatory or unkind. And um, people that haven't even met me have come up to me with a tainted view of me because of what somebody else said about me, only to find that actually I'm, I wasn't that bad after all, or what they said wasn't, uh, what they'd heard about me wasn't true after all. Um, so we've got to be really, really careful with that kind of thing. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 16 says, Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Wow, that's a powerful one. People who cross our paths every day, I believe, could be placements that are put there by God because he knows that that person needs a kind word and you have been tasked with bringing it. What did you do with that opportunity? You know, I like to set an example in that one because it brings great results. Acknowledge someone else's situation and see the results. I love doing that because it kind of takes people by surprise. I remember um, my wife and I were at the baggage claim um, at the airport in Phoenix, um, Arizona, in America, a few years ago. We'd flown in from Heathrow. We were going to a conference and um, we arrived, but our bags didn't. In fact, we had three bags um, and two of them did not arrive. They were still in Heathrow when we got to Phoenix. Um, and uh, they'd had a problem getting all the bags onto the plane and many passengers had made the journey only to find out that their bags were still back in London. And there was this one lady, and I must remember it was in late flight. We'd got in there just before midnight. And there was this poor young lady at the baggage counter in Phoenix taking a verbal pounding from irate passengers as if she had personally got their bags lost, as if she had personally been in London and took their bags off the plane. You know, this poor girl, can you imagine what it was like? As soon as the plane landed, she gets handed a memo that says, oh, by the way, a lot of these passengers, their, their bags are not with them and they're not going to be happy. Can you imagine how she must have felt? What was that like for her? She's thinking to herself, I come to the end of a shift here and this is how it's going to end. I'm about to have a horrible time for stuff that wasn't my fault. She hadn't personally done all the damage. So Jenica and I decided to treat her nicely. It was as simple as that. I remember saying to my to my wife, um, this poor girl, she's, you know, I really feel sorry for her. And when we got to the front of the queue, we spoke softly and we told her how we feel so terribly sorry for her. I said to her, this is awful for you, isn't it? My goodness, people are being so rude to you and you had nothing to do with this. I said to her, you are doing so well <clears throat> under the pressure and we fully understand how hard this is for you. She almost became emotional when she and, when, and she thanked us for our understanding. She took out details and then handed us a few spending vouchers to buy food and toiletries at the airport shop. Vouchers that I never actually saw her giving to anyone else. <laughs> Waiters in busy restaurants are very often students putting themselves through their studies or single parents trying to make ends meet while some carer looks after their children back at home. Talk nicely to them. Maybe other things on their mind. They didn't make your food late. They didn't um, make your steak well done and you wanted it rare. They didn't make your coffee cold. They delivered to your table timeously whatever they had to deliver. They're not the chef. It was not their fault. Be nice to them. Don't make any waiter regret serving you. When we joke, does our humor reflect the God that we serve or does our joke have a victim? International pastor and speaker Paul Scanlon talks about how he stopped a joke being told at a table where he was about to be the guest speaker at a function. Um, because he said, I could tell uh, when this person started the joke that a black person was going to be the victim uh, of the joke and was going to be the butt of the joke. And he said, I said to this person, um, so I'm just gonna stop you for a moment. Um, I can tell by the tone of your joke that a black person, it's gonna be said at the expense of a black person, are they going to be the laugh line, the punch line? And so I'm going to give you two options. I just either let me go and go away from the table for five minutes. I'll wait for five minutes till you finish telling the joke and then I'll come back or you stop telling the joke. <laughs> what a brilliant response. The person didn't tell the joke. What an absolutely brilliant response. 
you know, that, that, that's communication. It's laying down our boundaries and saying, I'm not going to be a part of a conversation that does that. Our humor needs to reflect God and our own principles. Don't get involved in a joke that, you, that goes completely against what you believe and, and who you are. And laughing at it is endorsing it. What do we endorse by what we laugh at? Matthew 10, 42 tells us to be a cup of cold water to others. Not a cup thrown in their face either, but a cup that comforts and refreshes. I want to be a cup of water rather than a bitter pill. Let our conversations be good. Let them be helpful, fun and funny when appropriate, but never hurtful and always giving hope and letting the other person walk away feeling refreshed having spoken to you, even if it was a brief encounter. Are you refreshing or are you exhausting in conversation? You know, we're called to be light and light cannot help but shine. We're called to be seasoning to a bland world. So let people know that you've spent time with Jesus just by the way you speak. I hope this has been helpful to you. Okay, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you and that you are the greatest communicator and you have set such incredible, clear examples to us about speech and how you would tell stories and you would rebuke out of love because people had crossed a boundary line, yet you'd never resorted to unkindness and gossip and so forth. I want to thank you for the example you've been to me and to so many of us that are, that are watching this. My prayer right now, Lord God, is that you'd let us reflect holiness in our conversation. Let us be carriers of... Um, of light in, into other conversations. There'll be carriers into, of light when we're in social settings. Let us be good conversationists. Those of us that are shy and reserved, Lord, I, I just pray that you would help us even in the conversations that we do have, you know, just to have that confidence to be the person that you want us to be and to best reflect the principles of the kingdom of God in all that we say and do. And we're grateful to you for the church because that gives us the opportunity to have conversation. And we thank you for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, if you've never given your life to Christ and you've never actually reached a point where you can call yourself a Christ follower, why don't you just invite him in right now? Jesus, come into my life. I'm sorry for the way I've lived my life up to now. And I choose to place my life under new management from this day forward. God will bless you with that. Thank you so much for joining us here at Eternity Church. We'll be back again next week with another challenging message. You have an absolutely fantastic day.